We had a quote down here from our friend Ronan Manley. One unappreciated aspect of this gold price discovery scandal is that daily London LBMA gold price auctions are deliberately ignoring COMEX gold prices when setting the opening price. Hopefully, sir, you'd be kind enough to break that down for us. Hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcadia Economics. And it is time once again for the Dave Transler Weekly Silver and Gold Update. Dave, nice to have you over there today. I see we got a new hairstyle, a little, uh, little renegade cowboy. Looks like a trader who's been smashing something for a portion of the trading day a little bit. But how are you today, sir? Uh, everything going all right? Oh, I, I can't find my brush. I can't well, find my comb. Well, it's I guess windy. That's it was windy to... out here this morning. One of the perks of being sexiest gold and silver analyst around, hair, comb, not comb, doesn't matter. Stop. Real quick, folks, before we dig in, today's video is sponsored by Miles Franklin. So if you're in the market to buy or sell gold, silver, platinum, or palladium, um, just need more information or a price quote, you can always get that at Arcadia at milesfranklin.com. <clears throat> And with that said, Dave, uh, as is always the case, um, especially lately, the game of musical chairs on the COMEX and the LBMA continues. And I know you had an article here today. I'm going to hit my share screen button. LBMA uses unallocated gold to manipulate the fix. Um, you had a quote down here from our friend Ronan Manley. One, uh, one unappreciated aspect of this gold price discovery scandal is that daily London LBMA gold price auctions are deliberately ignoring COMEX gold prices when setting the opening price in the twice daily gold price auction. So hopefully, sir, you'd be kind enough to break that down for us and uh, give an idea of what you were thinking in that article. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. I just had to put a blog post up. <laughs> Where all the great ideas come from, right? Before I went to the tennis courts. <laughs> um, actually, I mean, what he did is he he wrote his his um, his article fantastically well written and researched, um, and uh, he basically put down on paper what I kind of figured was going on all along, which is that, <clears throat> I mean, essentially, I mean, I think historically, you know, way back when, because the, the LBMA fix has been around since, I believe it was founded in 1919 by the Rothschilds. I was just saying, uh, and I'm sorry for interrupting, although actually reading a book about the history of some of these banks, and it's interesting you mentioned 1919, I was reading about that Treaty of Versailles. Um, the Rothschilds were involved, J.P. Morgan pops up were. in these deals, and uh, so anyway, please continue. It's a fascinating uh, topic, certainly. Yeah, it actually, when you read stuff like that, it, 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 it like makes you understand why what a lot of the stuff that we talk about today is not conspiracy theory, it's conspiracy <laughs> truth. But at any rate, so the fix, they fix the price twice a day, a.m., p.m., and that would be the price that would clear the market for buyers looking for physical gold and sellers looking to sell physical gold. And I, I believe, I'm sure at up to a, a certain point in time, actual physical gold would change legal possession at those fixes. You see what I'm saying? So now, you know, you got these, these, these London vaults, these, you know, that presumably hold all these bars of gold, and a lot of that gold is like in unallocated accounts. So let's just say you invest in, I don't know, something like the Kitco gold account, where you give them money and they give you an account statement that says, yeah, this is, this is your gold. This is the gold that you have that you've, you know what I'm saying? And so that gold, let's just say they're 400 ounce bars. I just want to use that as an example because it's easy. I don't think Kitco account is a 400 ounce gold bar account. But uh, so then you get a piece of paper that says, okay, you know, you've got an unallocated gold bar, which basically means you've got nothing because the bank doesn't, 
doesn't need to cough up that bar unless you actually say, hey, I'd like delivery of that bar. And a lot of people don't take delivery. They don't want to pay for storage, et cetera. So they are told that they have gold in an unallocated account, which is essentially a digital entry that, you know, so you get your monthly account statement, account statement like you get your brokerage account statement. Now the allocated account would be if you bought a gold bar and said, I want my name on that, I want title to the bar, and I'll pay for storage. That still doesn't mean that they don't hypothecate the gold bar. They probably do, but um, you know, at least you have a legal claim on, a, on an actual physical gold bar sitting in a vault, right? So um, what they're doing at the fix every day is, is, is they're basically, you've got buyers who say they want to buy gold and, sell, and sellers who say they want to sell gold. Uh, the, the sellers, I think, are mainly the banks, and they could be representing um, producers or whatever. But essentially, the banks know that they don't have to come up with these gold bars at the time of the fix because the buyers aren't going to take delivery. So it's essentially, again, it's it's paper gold that's being used to allocate or to to you know clear the supply and demand for gold at the at the twice daily fix. So, and then the bank gets your money and the bank had, you know, they can do what they want with that money, right? And it's only an issue for them if you'd call them up and say, I want my gold bar. Um, so that was in the gist of Ronan's article and people sh should read it. I mean, I'm just gonna do a brief summary here, a, a brief drive-by, people should read it because it's a fantastic article. And, it, and it ex I mean, it, it basically, lays out why the LBMA is just as manipulated as the COMEX. Um, and so essentially what Ronan is saying, when they set the fix, they're not taking into account all the market, all the market data that they should be taking into account because one of those, one of the features they should be taking into account or one of the data points is the, the price of the front month CME COMEX gold contract. And he, he, spells it out, he outlines it, you know, his email back and forth with the LBMA contact that's, you know, and, and the guy never would directly answer his question. So, and that's part of the reason why there's such a big spread between the spot price <clears throat> and the futures price, because futures price, on the assumption that guys who are buying the futures want to take delivery, they're paying a higher price to take delivery of gold down the road, a much higher price. You know, a much higher price over and above the theoretical cost of storage and time value of money that's supposed to be priced into a futures contract, right? So you went to war, you know, you know how to have a, the variables that go into pricing a futures contract. So people are saying, okay, look, I know I'm not going to get my bar if I, if I ask for it now. So I'm not going to give you money right now that you can use at your leisure or at your capriciousness. I'm just going to go buy a futures contract and hopefully, you know, I'll hear that bars are starting to be delivered again. And at that point, I'll be willing to, to cough up money to take delivery of a bar. So that's the COMEX futures, same thing with forwards. And so um, Ronan's, I think my theory on, on part of the reason why there's a spread is, is um, applies here. And then Ronan's theory on why the spot price, because Technically, the spot price is the, the price that's set at the AM and PM fix. And everything else keys off of that. A lot of derivatives contracts that are written on precious metals key off the fix. A lot of uh, actual users of gold key their, their pricing off of the fix. He, he talks about it in his article. So that's, that's, that's the actual official spot price, not the Kitco price. That's a BS number for the most part. Um, and, and so, you know, he was, he's laying out the case for why there's this discrepancy between spot and futures. And it's because essentially they're using, you know, this, this concept of unallocated gold, which is essentially derivative gold to settle the fix. And, and, um, they're not taking into account all of the price data, for instance, like I said, people people know they're not going to get gold now, so they'll go buy gold in the futures market and pay a higher price. That's the price they're willing to pay for a bar of gold in the future. 
So that price should be incorporated into the spot price. Yep. That's kind of the gist of the article. And I probably butchered the explanation, but um, if you, you know, if the audience is really interested in this, read, take the time to read his article, read every word of it. It was beautiful, Dave. It's beautiful. I mean, I don't know about that uncalled for shot below the belt, rubbing salt in my Wharton sore spot. Although maybe no, I wasn't just... rubbing salt. I mean, you know, you took finance 201 and that's where they, they go into futures pricing. At least I think that's I think just that's where we covered it at Chicago. You're fighting dirty because I sent you a joke email inviting you to a Wharton Jeremy Siegel presentation. Oh, for you learn about stocks for the long run. Um, I think I'd rather be waterboarded than sit through one of his lectures. Well, <laughs> the joys of Keynesian economics. Although, based on everything you just said, though, about the gold market, I'm curious. All right, I think, you know, certainly a lot of this was caused by Corona. You have parts of the supply chain getting shut down. What do you think happens once, uh, you know, we're here in Denver and I, I don't know which parts. I know some stores are allowed to open tomorrow. So as the world starts opening back up and at least seemingly move past Corona, hopefully, um, do you see this calming down in the gold and silver markets at all? I guess to me, what gets left unsaid a lot is that, you know, all right, Corona came and maybe it goes, but still you have the Fed printing unlimited. I'm wondering what you see happening once Corona is whenever that is out of the way a little bit more. Well, are you talking about what do I think is going to happen economic wise? economy Starting wise? Specifically to the gold up? and the gold market oh. and some of these liquidity conditions we've seen. Do you think that goes dissipates as Corona ends or is this it's interesting. Well, with I don't, I don't think, you know, this idea that people were buying gold futures or buying gold coins and silver coins because because they're fearful of the virus is absurd i mean people people are buying exposure to gold or you know buying physical gold because it's it's the it's the best way to hedge against reckless central bank and government policies so it's your it's your best way to hedge against the enormous dollar or fiat currency devaluation but especially the dollar that's going on right now with all this money printing and there's there's going to be a lot more money printing to come, and that's that's really the the rocket fuel for gold, you know, not a trade war with China or, you know, a, a tiff in Syria with with Russia. That people don't go out and buy gold because of that. They they buy gold because all of a sudden they don't trust fiat currency, and they have a, a right not to trust it with the rate at which the 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 central banks, specifically the Fed, are printing money. Yeah. I mean, look at, look, at it, look at it this way. We've got, what, something like another $3 trillion in treasury issuance coming in the next month or whatever the time frame is. Who's gonna, who, who the hell's going to buy that? Who's going to buy that paper? I don't think China's going to step up to the plate and say, oh, yeah, we'll take, we'll take our standard allocation of treasury bonds in this auction. No. You know, they wouldn't even do it. Uh, as a favor, Russia's not buying. Who, who's going to buy this stuff? You know, the Saudis probably not. So the Fed's going to have to print a lot of money to soak up a lot of that supply. I mean, we're here. We are. We're we're in your mo modern monetary theory system. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're you're completely right. In fact, I got a fun one for you here. I hadn't looked at the U.S. national debt clock in a while. Would you? <laughs> Would you care to make a market on, where, where do you think the U.S. national debt is? I think you'll be a little surprised because obviously it's been going fast. Where, where do you think it's at today? Let's see. You want me to make a market in it? Yes, please. Uh, 24 and a half trillion bid, 25 and a half trillion offered. Wow, folks. There's a reason why Dave Kranzler is the man. In I fact, haven't looked at it either, like, you know, in quite you, you know, a bunch of times. You nailed it but. so perfectly because, in fact, I recorded, it may have been Tuesday, so two days ago, uh, today we're, as we're recording this on Thursday, um, it was actually like 24.9. So it is exciting to see when we've crossed a quarter of a quadrillion. Um, 
Dave, if you can see down here, it's also interesting. They have the dollar to gold ratio now at 21,263 per ounce. The dollar to silver ratio now is at $2,500.65. Wait, what, what is that the currency outstanding? I've been, uh, it's on my list to see what their actual formula is here. I believe they're just saying amount of dollars to amount of silver. And I'm guessing somewhere in here they have. Uh, right, but how are they measuring dollars? Is it, is it uh, currency outstanding or is I, it? I'm not sure which figure. I mean, here we have money. The uh, quantity of money. Is it the Austrian true money supply? I mean, if you said the dollar gold ratio to me, I'd say, dude, it's, 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 it's the price of gold right now. It's 1726. <laughs> I mean, I get what you're saying. I'm just the pointing out. It's just amazing how big those numbers are. Um, and like you said, we probably have no idea how much, how many dollars are actually out there. Although uh, before we wrap up again, you said that you didn't think uh, people were going to stop buying gold mainly because of what the Fed is doing. And I couldn't resist this one because I was hearing uh, yesterday about how Kenneth Rogoff, professor of economics at Harvard. So again, this is where our smartest uh, economic savants are coming from. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I came from Wharton. I don't know if it was any different there. In fact, I remember in 2009 reading uh, Greg Mankiw from Harvard was saying the real problem with what was happening then was that you know people weren't spending enough. He was talking about negative interest rates, and now Ken talking about the case for implementing negative interest rate policy. You know, this is Ken, not Jerome Powell. <laughs> my own my own belief is that the Fed's real goal is to get to interest rates of negative 100%. So just what? anything you put in any bank, the Fed takes and eats um, with an unlimited QE, we might not be far off, but Dave, thoughts on, uh, will we see negative interest rates here in the US? Well, I think Ken Rogoff's brains fell out of his head along with his hair. I mean, honestly, Harvard's not really, known for standout economists. The last one to, in my recollection that was worthwhile paying attention to was probably John Kenneth Galbraith. But um, needless to say, I, I personally, unless, unless the powers that be, the Fed and the White House wanna completely trash the dollar, I, I just don't see the Fed taking interest rates negative. I think it would do more harm to the status of the dollar, of the dollar as the reserve currency, which it's losing status every day anyway. Um, and also, honestly, we've had, we've had low rates for so long and it, they're obviously not stimulating real economic activity. So I don't, I personally think like if they took rates negative, I would leave the bare minimum amount of cash. Like, I don't know what they would do with demand deposits, checking accounts. Like, are they going to charge you to keep your money in a demand deposit? But if I had money in a savings account, which I don't and never will, I think if they went negative and all of a sudden started <clears throat> taking money out of everyone's savings account every month um, or every quarter or whatever, I think that it would, I think essentially what you'd see is a, a, at least a run on savings accounts. And you definitely see the flight of, flight of dollars out of banks, unless people just want to be irrational and pay to have a bank keep their money. And the only reason to keep your money in a bank right now is, is to pay monthly bills electronically, as far as I'm concerned. If I had to, I suppose if I could, you know, pay all my bills easily with cash, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use a bank at all. So I, I don't think they're gonna take rates negative. I mean, it, to the extent that they're, 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 they're gonna, um, you know, well, they're printing money mainly to keep the banking system from collapsing, but you know, if they wanted to have some, I, some thought of trying to stimulate economic activity with money printing, which 
that that won't work either. Um, I think if if they're going to try and connect monetary policy with economic stimulus, I think they'll just keep printing money. And you know, rate they may leave rates at zero, but th that's what I think. But I mean, who knows? I mean, what's going on out here gets crazier by the day in terms of um, the path that our leaders are leading us down. Le our, our leaders. I'm not. <laughs> There's a generous way of phrasing it. Um, Dave, I appreciate what you mentioned there so that if listeners to the show who are watching today um, wanna get a head start on getting cash, I'm not, by all means, I'm not telling anyone to take cash out of the bank, but if you did wanna do so in advance of negative interest rates, um, while you brilliantly nailed the debt clock, I was thinking about it yesterday. Here we see U.S. 10-year, 0.636%. And it hit me. I'm like, well, the Fed still has their 2% inflation mandate. So we don't have to use John Williams shadow stats numbers anymore to calculate a negative real yield. But here you see less than 1% is what you're getting on your treasury. While the Fed says we are going to guarantee we're going to print enough, to make sure, I mean, obviously the real number is much greater than 2%, but just in terms of a real re rate of return, even using the silly fictitious government numbers, uh, just find it interesting that we're already getting that negative yield. So Dave, if you still have any- We've had negative real, real rates for a long time. Like at least since, since late 2007, maybe longer. Well, if with shadow stats numbers, not always with government. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about real negative rates. Real negative rates means we're using a real inflation number, not the CPI. The CPI isn't constructed to measure inflation. The CPI is constructed to, as a political tool for, for the politicians and the policymakers. I'm in agreement with you, sir. I'm just saying, even by their own silly Mickey Mouse numbers. Well, if you were in disagreement with me, you'd be wrong. <laughs> well, however you look at it, um, the negative rate of return is here. And fortunately, Dave has been kind enough to leave behind all the answers on investmentresearchdynamics.com, which you can probably see none of the answers, answers. what it looks like. Some of the great products he has there, Mining Stock Journal, the Short Sellers Journal, and the Mining Stock Daily, which actually I was, uh, I was a guest on earlier this week, talking about silver, if you can believe that. So uh, <laughs> Dave, are you, are you ready? Come on, get, where's the description and the link for that information? Right there in the description below is where you can get another chunk of Dave Kranzler's beautiful brain in digital format, covering the Stop. financial markets and the gold and silver markets. So with that said, Dave, I appreciate you joining me again here. You did beat Andy Sheckman in the view count last week, so I'm glad you're feeling better. And folks, if you want to find out a little bit more about what's going on, well, there's another video coming your way now. The man.